broadcasting from Orchard Park, New York, and Boca Raton, Florida, it's the Freight 360 Podcast. From freight broker sales tips to sports talk, this podcast is all about helping you grow as a freight broker. We're your hosts, Nate Cross and Benjamin Kowalski. Let's talk freight. Welcome back for another episode of Freight 360. What's up, Freight 360 Nation? We're going to talk about co-brokering today and how it compares to double brokering. That's been sort of a hot topic the last handful of years, but it's been a, an ongoing thing for a very long time. So we'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, but first, make sure if you haven't already, uh, hit that subscribe button, hit the um, follow or like, whatever, whatever the buttons are on each platform. Leave us a comment, leave us a review, share us with your friends, send us your questions. We'll answer, answer them each week as we have time. And check out our website, freight360.net. It's got our whole library of all of our blogs, videos, all the content, some downloadable content as well. And while you're there, check out the Freight Broker Basics course. That's our full length educational piece that'll help you get started on your journey in the freight brokering world. Uh, ben, what's happening, man? How's Florida? I'm back I'm back where it's not sunny and warm anymore, but what's going on down south? Uh, not bad. Weather's been pretty much the same since you left. We haven't seen any rain and it's basically kind of just waiting for the rainy season, which is usually like the very beginning of May. Then it rains every afternoon for like the next three months. Well, you're from the Northeast originally. So you know the whole April showers bring May flowers, May flowers. right? So there it's yep. uh, it's Wednesday right now and it's raining here. It's supposed to rain tomorrow as well. It's funny because like yesterday, a lot, it was like it was sunny and like 60, like for a little bit. And people, yep. everyone was out there like doing their first mowing of the year, like cutting their grass. I, I was that like, Ooh, should I do it? And I go out there, I'm like, uh, I was busy as it was, but like my grass was still kind of wet. We have a very like shady front and backyard. Um, we don't get a whole lot. Well, we get some sunlight, but not enough that it, it was nice and dry. Um, so I'll have to wait. I'll have the ugly lawn for another couple of weeks. But spring is uh, spring is here and summer's around the corner. Can so. always clean up the front and get to the back later. Keep up appearances. That's true. Curb appeal. Um, so a little sports here. The... Uh, the late Juice, a.k.a. O.J. Simpson, um, died last week. Did you hear, like, so everyone was expecting that he would give, like, a deathbed confession, and he didn't. Yeah. So, like, just silence. Well, here's what I did hear, though. Two interesting things about that. One, in his will, um, there was, like, a clause, and I can't remember how it was phrased, but it basically prohibited... Um, was it Ron Goldman's family that mostly, I think, sued him and won the lawsuit? Um, anyway, you know, that he owed hundreds Wrong of millions of dollars. Lawsuit you're talking about? Correct. Yeah. And in his will, there was a clause that basically none of the damages that or none of anything that got liquidated could not go to him. And then his attorney spoke out after the death and said, like, you know, like his last wish or basically was that none of his estate goes to pay that wrongful death, whatever. Right. Again, I don't know. They were talking about on morning radio on like sports radio. And I was like, that is wild. I mean, like, yeah, the exact just, opposite of a deathbed confession. Right. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the exact opposite. Oh man. And it was his pretty... Broncos up for sale. I heard um, for really, it's going to be auctioned. There's like three guys owned it and they said, you know, it's the 30th anniversary. They were going to plan on selling it anyway, but they're expecting like a million to a million and a half. It's on loan to some museum right now, but they said it only has 30,000 miles on it. So I mean, <laughs> Hey, if you're in the, in the market for a, 30 year old Bronco with 30,000 miles on it. That was yeah. The last, the last 10 or 20 miles on it. I have a, a good story behind it. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's OJ. Uh, the masters man, Scotty Scheffler got a second green jacket in yep. three years and it wasn't even close. Like he won by like a margin of like four strokes at the end or something like that. Yeah. He kind of ran away with it. I mean, and to be honest also, like he didn't look great or let me rephrase. I don't want to say he didn't look great, but he missed like three of the first four or five greens, like long, short, like wasn't, I well, wasn't hitting greens really early on. Yeah. And I mean, I was texting all my buddies too, watching. I'm like, I don't know. I hope he holds up. But like, I just kind of felt like he was going to win the whole tournament. And I'm like, I don't know why it was. I mean, he's a great golfer. He's number one in the world. But they even said like, 
for the odds on favorite to actually win the masters hasn't happened since 2005 when tiger won it when he was the favorite so like even the world number one and the odds on favorite rarely ever actually wins the tournament because it's so competitive yeah. and there's literally the entire field of the world's best is and when you say that. favorite it's not even like they're a majority like it, it, no. it's, a, it's a plus bet if you're if you know sports it was betting, one it to like 500 a- it was, yeah, it was as a Saturday. 500. It was bet a hundred to win five hundred. I think Morikawa and Max Homa that were second and third at the time. It was like bet a hundred to win like twelve hundred. Yeah, give or take. So wild. Um, Olympics coming up in July. So as of like today, I think it was a hundred days out. Did you see? Uh, so obviously, people are always like, do you, you know, do Olympians get paid? Why don't they get paid? They can be paid by their country. Um, but for the first time ever, the, the Olympic committee set aside, it was like $2.4 million for track and field to award the like 40 some gold medalists, 50 K each. So first time you're seeing Olympians be paid by the actual Olympic committee versus their, their host nation. So be yeah. curious. So did you also see the, the girl from UConn? I can't remember her name, the basketball player. Her contract came out this week for the women's yes. NBA. And it was crazy to see. Um, I think it was like $70,000 for her first year versus these guys that are making millions in the NBA. And there's like all kinds of you know uproar about it. But the reality is they're like the market's not there yet for women's NBA. It's the same way that. Not even close. Like, uh, NFL players 30, 40 years ago see contracts say they're had like two jobs. Man. Yeah. Back in like, the sixties and the seventies, like yeah. that wasn't even a full time job for baseball players, basketball players, or football players back in the day. And again, like they also did, I saw like they showed they were talking about the revenues, right, of the leagues. And it's like by a factor of almost a hundred, right? Like what one league brings yeah. in from fans and the amount of people that watch it. And to be honest, like it's a product. That's the number of customers. There's more customers in one right now. This one's growing. She's going to be instrumental, I think, in growing it. I think but they so, also yeah. play in the summer. They play a shorter season. And most of the WNBA players also play in Europe. So, like, it's also not when we watch a lot of sports because we're outside. So, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of things, I think, that go into that beyond. Yeah, the and the NBA has a big following in China, which women's NBA doesn't. So, I think, like you said, hopefully she'll, um, you know, help like be a catalyst to, to grow that. I mean, think about all the, the random sports, not that basketball is random, but different sports that have gained traction over, you know, a period of years. And it, it doesn't just happen overnight because of For one, sure. you know, one player, but, um, but it's trending yeah. that way. And I think it's good. I mean, I have a daughter. I, I mean, I like watching sports. I think it's great that more girls and they're playing more too, right? Like you're seeing younger kids. Another guy I was talking to the same thing as like a daughter and, you know, teenage years. And he's like, you know, when we were kids, there just weren't year round leagues for most women's sports for kids, right? Like whether it's soccer or basketball or whatever. Now these kids are playing basketball all year round. There's leagues 12 months a year, no matter what girls sport it is. And to me, like the more that you have, there's the feeders, right? Like, yeah, all of the high school leagues, you got more girls that want to play because they're watching more. There'll be more in college and more college talent. You're going to see more talent go into, you know, major league sports for women. So I think it's a really positive trend. Really for sure. like seeing it. It'll be interesting. Uh, Caitlin Clark, that's her name. Played yes. for, uh, I believe it was UConn. So. And to Stephen's point, there was uh, there was some stuff in Free Caviar, but also Brush Pass put this out um, on what the revenues look like last year. I got year. that Just- in our news, Ben. Look at the uh, show notes awesome. here. I already had it teed up. Um We'll hit on that first, actually, and then we'll get to the other news. So, the yeah, so Kevin Hill, Brush Pass, Research. This came out, I think, this morning is when I saw it, so I added it in here. But um, 2023, freight brokerage revenues declined 15%. That's a year over year, all right? But it's still 56% higher than it was in 2019. And we all, if well, if you've been in the industry for five years or longer, 2019 was the last time that we saw a down market, right? We had a boost in 2018 and then we had a down market in 2019. So we're 56% higher than we were in 2019. But again, recency bias makes us all feel like, well, we just saw the COVID surge or the post COVID surge in 2021, 22. And now where it feels like a, a two year hangover. Um, so that was interesting stat. Yep. The other one that he had, the, uh, did you see like the, 
the pie chart that showed like the breakdown of the large brokerages yes. and, and the revenue. I sent it to a few people first thing this morning because it's a really good summary of how the market or the total addressable market for freight brokerages breaks down by revenue and size. Yeah. So it was the largest 150 brokerages. They make up 70% of the revenue. That's that's a lot. And then think about this. The top 3.5% of brokerages have 88%. And that's a it's a astounding stat because with tens of thousands, I think there's like twenty some thousand active brokerages right now. The vast majority of them aren't really doing anything, right? Like they maybe maybe they never even move a load, right? Stephen just put in the notes twenty seven thousand four hundred and fifty active uh, brokerages right now. But I would be willing to bet half of them don't move anything. A bunch of them are just really small, less than a million dollars a year. And again. Brush Pass Research has a lot of da- uh, uh, stats on this. And then the other thing, um, thanks for adding this in the notes there, Stephen. The Transport Topics did add their, their they released their uh, top 100 companies. If, you, if you're a Transport Topics um, member, I think if you're part of TIA, you get like the, I get literally a magazine once a week. Um, so... Yep. I think we only get one, Ben. That's why you're not getting them stacked up at your house, but you get access online too. They put out like the the top 100 logistics companies, the top 100 freight forwarders, top 100 freight brokerages. Um, I will tell you this, that I worked at a company in the past that had higher revenue than companies in that list, but they only list companies that are willing to release their revenue, yes. right? Yep, so if you don't helps. partake in sharing your data with them, um, that will lead to you not being on their list. It doesn't really get you anything besides, you know, being on their list. But the list does have some skew, um, you know, potential skew to it based on people not sharing their data. But and there were some and, noteworthy things, right? Like, and uh, this is out of Freight Caviar too, right? So Schneider stood out was basically the only company that bucked the trend because their revenue climbed from one point six four billion to two point two. And the shakeup really at the bottom of the leaderboard with familiar names slipping out of the top 20. Redwood went from 1.2 down to 640 million. And they do a lot in the bulk space. Convoys, um, not on the list anymore, obviously. And Trinity also off the list. So, so some noteworthy. You're looking at logistics companies or the, cause the, the specific freight brokerage because they have multiple lists. Keep in mind. That should so, be the brokerage. That that was off the brokerage list. So out of so the tra- got, from, topics. From transport topics right now, they're 2023 top freight brokerage firms. Um, you said Armstrong or no, I'm sorry, Trinity. Trinity's at 1.2 billion. They're number 17. No, it said that Redwood went from 1.2 billion down to 640 million was what Freight Caviar cited. Gotcha. Interesting. Oh, my old company's on here at number 43. Nice. They finally decided to disclose their data. Um, CH Robinson, top of the list. This is 2023 top freight brokerage firms. CH Robinson, $15.8 billion. TQL, $8.7 billion. Coyote is number three. Worldwide Express, number four. Lancet, number five. Six through 10 are Mode, Echo Global, RxO, Uber Freight, and JB Hunt. All at over two and three billion dollars a year. Big market, a lot of a uh, lot of freight out there. Um, lastly, in news, the Baltimore Bridge. Did you see the FBI probing and doing an investigation into the the ship? I did Which, not. Yeah, so they the ship. Uh, again, this all came from like an anonymous source who didn't want to be. It sounds like they were on the ship or they were in the area and knew about this, but basically there was known electrical issues before it left the port and they left anyway. So the FBI is launch- launching a criminal investigation. So we'll see how that happens. At the very uh, least, it sounds though like it's negligence, not like oh, for sure. malicious behavior. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's a tragedy regardless, but um, there's, I think it's kind of obvious. No one tried to, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's some Correct. conspiracy theorists out there that, you know, my, my brother-in-law included that think that there's a, whenever something like this happens, it's, it's the deep state, right? Of course. But uh, um, 
you know, no one's, I don't think that the majority of people think that it was intentional, but someone's at fault. Was it, you know, mechanical? Was it, you know, the error of a human? Was it poor to sit, you know, well, they'll get to the bottom of it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> Steven said, I always cover, laugh at that. Cover up for Diddy. There you go. Love we it. We were talking about that off, you know, just DC and stuff. It's like the, my friends and family that live there, they always kind of laugh at those like deep state comments, mostly because they're like, there's just so many people that don't like each other in DC that like, even if that existed, anybody who found out about it would have made it public to try to take them out of power. Right. Like it's just this constant push. So like, I don't know. I've also been rewatching House of Cards recently, so like it's kind of oh, love, love that Great show. Love that show. Yep. And then what? The last season they had to kill off. Uh... I dude, I'm rewatching. I don't remember it well enough. Oh, he's, he's like he, the guy got canceled. It was like public. Yeah, I know that happened for sure, but I just mean like I don't remember the storyline, and I just started like the fifth season. I've been watching right. it for like the past two three weeks. I, yeah, I won't say anything else then. Kevin Spacey. Yeah. Thank you, Steven. Tired of struggling to find accurate rates and the right cares for your freight? With DAT1, you can access more than 500 million posted loads and trucks every year. That's three times more capacity than any other load board. Plus, their integrated freight management system makes it easy to cover loads 24-7. They have the most trusted network of carriers, brokers, and shippers in the country. You'll get real-time rates on every lane so you know exactly how much a shipment will cost before you commit to it. Plus, you get instant access to top bids from qualified carriers around the country. Get 10% off your first year of DAT1 when you visit the link in the show notes. All right, uh, Ben, let's talk uh, co-brokering, man. That was a good, jump into that was a good intro today, man. A little, little sports and news banter there. So we get this question a lot from people that are new to the industry and it is a very valid question because I don't think I understood co-brokering and double brokering for like the first six to 12 months that I was on the three PL. Here's side. the other thing about this, right? Like the, the terms are not defined in any way that they're used consistently. Meaning like right. people interchange co-brokering with double brokering with fraud. And it's always kind of been that way, at least as long as I've been in it. But there's definitely been a shift for sure. Yes. And so on that note, the TIA does now use the phrase illegal brokerage activity when they are lobbying for anything regarding the fraud that we've seen in the double brokering space recently. All right. So we'll yeah. talk about we'll talk about co-brokering, double brokering, and then the illegal brokerage activity. Yep. Um, so um, we'll start with I'm going to start at the severe end, right? Illegal brokerage activity, which is oftentimes called double brokering. This is when somebody is brokering without a license to do so. Uh, oftentimes stealing someone's identity to make it look like they have a license. All right. Those are the common scams that we've seen lately. Um, double brokering could entail that, but could also entail a someone that is licensed and rebrokers a load without the consent of the other parties. Whereas co-brokering, is everybody's is, aware of it. it's rebrokered and it's transparent and everyone's on board with it. All right. So let's talk through uh, a little bit more detail how co-brokering works. So normally we have a shipper, a freight broker and a motor carrier. So yep. the shipper would tender a load to the freight broker. The freight broker would contract a motor carrier to pick up and deliver that load on their behalf. That's a standard brokerage transact transaction. Co-brokering is going to involve multiple brokers in the middle, typically two. So shipper gives load to broker A. Broker A, for one of many reasons, rather than finding a truck, gives it to broker B, and then broker B then finds that truck. And we'll we'll kind of break down the reasons why you would do this, but I at least wanted to uh, lay that out for you. And keep in mind, this is all transparent, right? Broker A knows what broker B is doing. Broker A knows what truck broker B is booking. Um, broker B knows the customer that broker A is using. Like all of this is transparent. We'll talk about the contract and the legal aspect of it in a little bit. Um, but in a nutshell, that is co-brokering. It is not illegal. It is not right. wrong. It is used very frequently for many reasons. And I want to go and reiterate, right, the other two scenarios that you explained, right? Then the other scenario too, right, is like, this is 
referred to as double brokering, but I think it should be referred to as unlicensed brokering. That is when a shipper gives a load directly to a motor carrier, that motor carrier then books another motor carrier on it, right? Like yep. they don't that's, have a license. That's fraudulent brokerage or your illegal brokerage activity. Yep. They do not have a license to hire anybody. They only have a license to perform the work they were contracted to perform. So if you, if a shipper worked directly with a motor carrier and that motor carrier sent another motor carrier in, that is unlicensed brokering. If that motor carrier hands that load to a brokerage that is owned by the same people and they broker it, that is also unlicensed brokerage because that motor carrier does not have the authority to hand the load to anybody but their own company drivers, right? Yep. And I think that's also, it, it happens in the industry and there's like a gray area with who's a lease on driver and who isn't too. We don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but like those are fundamentally, right? Like very simply how you look at this. Shipper to carrier, normal. Shipper, broker, carrier, normal. Co-broker, shipper, broker, broker, carrier, Okay, if everyone's on board and there's a piece of paperwork that says that, right? But if a load goes to a motor carrier and they don't move it and that load is moved by anyone else, that is unlicensed brokerage. And it can be fraud. It could be intentionally trying to steal something. It could just be trying to send another truck in to save face and you had the best intentions, but it's still unlicensed brokerage. So here, here's like the gray area. You have a trucking and a brokerage authority, right? Or you have both. Like, yep. so let's say you have a dual authority or you have two different MCs. We see this frequently and it's a gray area to an extent. So broker or trucking company has a brokerage. They sell themselves as an asset based company, get tendered a load, don't have a truck for it. And then they go broker through their brokerage onto a third party truck. Not technically illegal. So but question. It, can be, it can be frowned upon. Is that true? Because here's the point that I've always made and the way I, at least I see it is that depends on the you, contract. Depend, if you have both what, companies and yeah. you go through the procurement process with your asset MC, you are signing this piece of paper. And usually the terms of that agreement state that you are only using your trucks and that it is you yes. and this MC moving it. And but, if they onboarded the brokerage and the brokerage gave the load back to their motor carrier, now you don't have an issue. So, so let me give you an example, though. Mom and pop shop, small farm, right? Little small to medium sized company who doesn't do contracts or paperwork. They just say, yeah, I'm going to yes. give you this load, right? There's no contract that says X, Y, or Z is required. The, uh, the rep takes the load, uses their brokerage authority and brokers it. It's not illegal. It's, you know, there's for sure a gray area there and it is frowned upon. Um, because then if you're, if the customer doesn't know about it and they're like, I thought you were putting on one of your trucks, yes. like I would have just found someone who had their own truck. Cause now I'm paying a brokerage margin here. Like it, that's where, and that is how it used to be a lot of times before a lot of this fraud came into place. Yep. Um, but again, you can go down a rabbit hole on that contracts, um, a, a larger company. Yeah. Contracts are going to state, you know, a lot of different things. And another, another gray area is if we've seen this with large shippers, right? They have a requirement that you need to be asset based to get onboarded. But the specific rep at that company will tell you like, hey man, that's just corporate red tape. Like, I don't care what truck you send in here. I just got to onboard your asset MC and then you yep. can put whatever truck you want. It's like, uh, like what if push comes to shove? There's an accident, a fatality. And then we realize that our asset company was contracted with them, tendered the load, and then, you know, whoever, whatever the, whoever the lawyer is, is going to go after whoever's got the deepest pockets and as many pockets as possible. And your trucking company could be at risk. So uh, agreed. Dangerous. Like that's the point that I've always kind of looked at it is like, if something goes wrong, I feel like in a lawsuit, they're going to look and go through the chain of custody, if you will, of the tender, right? Like where did it go? Who was allowed to do what with it? And if you're in violation of a regulation or a statute by the FMCSA, that opens you up to liability, to lots of liability. And to me, that's where this gets very different. For sure. So, I mean, the legal side of it, right? If you don't have an authority, you're illegally brokering freight. The ethics behind it, if you do have an authority and you're doing it without transparency, Blue Book Services is the resource you need if you're transporting fresh produce or lumber. 
Their online databases contain thousands of companies throughout the produce and lumber industry supply chains. You can easily search their databases to generate new sales leads. Blue Book's credit ratings help you avoid companies with high credit risk, and their team can help resolve disputed loads. To learn more, go to ProduceBlueBook.com or LumberBlueBook.com and click join today. Or if you have, well, first of all, let's go back to the legal part. If the contract with the customer states you can't, you know, rebroker it, then yeah, you're breaking contract. Now the ethics side, right? We talked about some of the gray areas there. Um, if you're not being transparent, you're not putting the co-broker agreement in place, I would call that unethical. You know, the there's a, you know, a gray area of the legality, or the legality behind it, but the ethics are, are clearly in the wrong. So, yeah. And where we used to run into this a lot, again, a long time ago was like, this was really common within Landstar's. And oh, like, oh, yeah. this was something that like, again, was really common in the industry 10 years ago where some of the offices we could work with from a big, when I used to work at a big brokerage, like they were green. We could use those to book as asset trucks because we want, needed that Landstar trucks a lot of the time in certain areas, right? But a lot of them would be black flagged for this very reason, meaning you would book Landstar, they'd say they're booking their truck and then they would just broker another truck send in a truck and this is where it becomes an issue right is you think it doesn't matter as much you're like well if i paid landstar this dollar amount and they sent a truck do i does it really matter if they sent theirs or another and here's where it did was because in order to make that additional money the landstar rep again in the situation a long time ago they would hire a cheaper truck and well why does that matter because most of the time that cheaper truck had higher out of service ratings higher safety it had lower maintenance spend because they just didn't have the money to keep up with it so they're willing to run it for cheaper now it's like hey i thought i was putting this on one of your trucks i looked at your out of service i looked and vetted you you went and sent someone completely different it's like what I paid for and what I got are two different things. And I think that's also kind of where it breaks down ethically. Yeah. And so that brings up our next point of contracts. So the TIA has a model co-broker agreement, which um, highly recommend if you don't have one in your company, utilize theirs as a starting point. It, it is um, branded by TIA, which is totally fine. It's actually probably a good thing if people see that you're a TIA member. Um, but you can always use their model contract and have your attorney use it as a baseline and add verbiage in. because. Some of the things to your point, Ben, about maintenance on trucks, one of the things that I highly recommend that you have established in your co brokerage contract is who is responsible for vetting the motor carrier. And we mentioned broker A is who gets the load from the shipper. Broker B is who gets the, lo the load from broker A and then eventually hires a truck. So typically broker B would be responsible to um, Check call. hire and vet and do all your track and trace on that carrier. But broker A, like let's say that I got a load from my shipper and I'm going to co-broker to you, Ben. I could stipulate in my contract that, you know, you're going to be responsible to, to hire or to contract and vet and track and trace carriers, but all carriers that you contract must meet the following requirements. You can include that in a contract. So you could state that they've got to have, you know, whatever your thresholds are for uh, CSA scores or your length of authority or insurance requirements, whatever is, you know, SOP for you at your company, or in addition to that, your customer's requirements, that should be reiterated through that co-brokerage contract to the broker that's going to actually book a truck for you. All right. Um, or if it's not in the contract, you could state it somehow in written communication via email. That way you've got a paper trail that covers your butt that you're, you know, dotting your I's and crossing your T's. Um, so why would we do a co-brokerage, right? Let's talk through scenarios and you and I have different we have probably some the same, but some that are different scenarios in which co-brokering happens. I've acted as broker A, I've acted as broker B, um, more so as A, less as B. Um, so remember, A is when you're the one getting the load from the customer and giving it to somebody else. Actually, I said that backwards. I've acted more as B and less as A. Um, so I'll tell you when I've been broker A, and I am currently. All right, um, LTL, Intermodal, all right, and Expedite. So we've got co-brokerage agreements in place and I'm actually setting up some more rail co-brokers currently um, because my brokerage that I work for, we don't have enough LTL volume to secure competitive discounts from the, you know, the old dominions and T 
T forces, all the big LTL carriers, right? We don't have, if we go to a sale, I've done it before. If you go to the sales rep for these LTL companies and like, I know LTL very well. I used to, I, I started an LTL and I go to them. They're like, well, how much, how much LTL do you move? And I tell them it's like less than a hundred loads a month. They're like, okay, like here's your, here's your discount, which is very yep. slim. And then you go to a company that's a big LTL brokerage and they're getting like an 80% discount on the rates. So I would rather set up a co-brokerage with someone who's an expert and has a lot of um, leverage. Yeah, a lot of leverage and, and cost benefit in a certain niche market and take their rates and have them marked up than to go and have triple the rates on my own. So LTL, I've done a couple of co... Actually, I've done like four or five of them over the years. There's one main one that I use now. Um, basically, you know... I can go to my, we can go to a customer and get them a cheaper rate through this co brokerage agreement through quality regional and national LTL carriers, cheaper than if we did it on our own without the co brokerage. So it's a win win win. Everybody wins, right? Yep. The LTL and I, my, my assistant was actually asking me the other day, he's like, why do we do, like, why would we do a co brokerage? Like, wh- what's in it for everybody? And I'm like, well, the customer gets service by price. us and gets a good rate. We are able to service our customer and provide them a cheaper rate. The co brokers that we're using, is getting a little bit they otherwise wouldn't get and they make a which market. is how they get the leverage by the yes. way yep and then the the motor carrier gets the business that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten so everybody this is a win 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 everybody's winning in this situation right it's all transparent it's all contracted um it all works out good same for intermodal right? i was just going to go into that like yeah. just as a segue like intermodal is very similar in regards to the reasons why you do it right like trained like CSX, Canadian National, Union Pacific, any of the, you know, handful of rail companies, they won't negotiate for one shipment because like, think of the amount of people they would need to employ to talk to and service individual shipments. Like they deal with larger volumes. So the rail lines, again, negotiate directly with like the major shipping companies like Maersk and Costco and them. They also work with, to your point, other companies that just pull together everyone else's business so that they could negotiate with the rails to give the rail enough volume that it makes it worth it for them. And then the intermediary or brokerage, right? Same, then goes to all the other brokerages that just need intermodal from here, like occasionally, right? Like, hey, I got a couple of loads a week, a couple of loads a month. And then that broker pulls all of their customers together to get better pricing from the rail and for the same values, right? You know, we use them. And again, back in the day, all the big brokerages did that as well, because like you just couldn't even get individual pricing in intermodal without going through a co-brokerage situation. Yeah. And one of the things I really like about the intermodal co-broker is the, and it's the same with LTL. It's the ease of use, right? Where, when these are like, you can just go to a portal or go to your rep and say, here's the lane. Can you quote me door to door on this? Yep. Right. And with rail, rail gets like really, really detailed if you're doing a door to door move because you've got to get rubber, a, rail, rubber. You need exactly. to dray it to you the gotta rail. Get, you got to track the rail. Then you got to dray it on the other end to the delivery. Exactly. So what is that? If you're new to this, you if you can't visualize that picture, a, um, a truck pulling up with an empty container, right? That container yep. gets loaded up at the shipper, gets driven. We'll say, I don't know, 20 miles to a rail yard, gets loaded onto a train, driven 2,000 miles across the country, that container then gets offloaded onto another truck with a chassis and a, yep. you know power only and taken to its final destination. So you've got three pieces, like you said, rubber, rail, rubber. I've never heard it called that, but that's good. Um, and they do all the work for you, right? They're experts at that. They have the volume. They have the rates. They have the visibility on everything. You just go in, get your pricing, and boom, you're done. Yeah. Um, so that's where co-brokering is very, very beneficial. Again, everybody wins in that situation. You've done, well, let me, well, yeah, let's go to, on your side. So you've done it where you've used, you've co-brokered with just traditional truckload carriers based off of their capacity in, in a certain yes. region, correct? I've done A and B. In freight, time is money and efficiency is key. That's where levity comes in. Imagine automating your email operations to do more with less effort. Levity connects directly to your inboxes, extracting vital information from emails and attachments in real time. It seamlessly integrates with your TMS, empowering you to quote faster, build loads more efficiently, and book more freight in less time. 
Whether it's incoming emails from shippers or carriers, Levity's got you covered. It understands any language, any format, and even interprets non-standard formatting. Visit levity.ai today to sign up and get started. So I'll go through when I was broker A, right? So a situation that this worked really well, I had a large customer. It was a um, maritime broker. So they were you know, bringing the bulk steel in from Brazil into New Orleans. And they brought like one whole ship in a month, right? And that was like, end up being like, call it like five loads a day for basically that whole month. You know, 25 loads a week, 100 over that month was the entire ship that came in. Now, the issue I ran into when we tried to book all the trucks ourselves is it's a very centralized pickup, meaning like New Orleans, like there's not a lot of trucks that pass through it. There are trucks that go there to deliver, but it's not like the middle of the country. You don't drive through, you know, Louisiana or by the port area unless you're already going there. So there's a smaller number of trucks, first of all. Secondly, the destinations, there's only a handful. They went to the steel mills up around the Great Lakes, right? So if you picture, right, like every load's picking up at the port of New Orleans, and then they basically go the same way and then just branch off at the end to deliver to like steel mills around, right? What happens is, is if you are the only broker moving that much volume, and what I mean by volume, like that's not a huge number, five or six loads a day, but it is when you are pooling, you need as much of the flatbed capacity to go to a specific place on the other side of the country. There's just not that many flatbeds often that wanted to go there every day, like five or six every single day to go up there because there wasn't a much freight coming back. So like, you're like, okay, well, how do I keep a consistent price for my customer to bid this all month, which is also hard. And then you're like, well, as soon as the market kind of realizes I need this amount of trucks every day, you lose your pricing leverage, meaning the carriers all kind of talk to each other and they're like, well, hey, what did you make? What did you make? Then they start coming back to you after three or four or five days, like you're trying to hold an average for your customer and pay them the same rate, but they all start negotiating up and you don't really have a choice because you can't pull capacity from south of it. It's the Gulf of Mexico. Like there's nowhere else to go. Yeah. And you can't pay trucks to come in from like Alabama and Tennessee because the deadhead's too expensive. So it's like, well, how do you keep a consistent price so that you can actually work over a month and still make this work? And what we found was, again, if I was the only one posting the loads like from TQL back in the day, this is where I was running this, like I'm the only one posting this much volume. So it's very apparent what's happening. They all just start negotiating back and I can't hold any type of consistency, right? What I found was, and I used a Landstar broker that I had worked with and other things, so we had a great relationship. And I'm like, well, how many trucks can you get every day this week? What do you think you can provide on the asset side? And he gave me the number, right? I'm like, okay. Well, what can we do? Because I still need to get a couple extra trucks throughout the week that I'm not able to get. And I don't want to keep pushing my loading schedule because the boat's only there for so long. And then you can only keep it there. Then you pay storage. So there's lots of reasons why you can't just extend time, but you still got to be able to keep this rate. And then what we found was if myself and him were posting around the same rate and working the same lane, even with the same commodity, there were just trucks that had a preference to work with them over TQL. Maybe exactly. they worked with a broker that they didn't like, or somebody made a bad decision somewhere along the line or whatever. There's a number of reasons why a carrier and a broker end up not working together in the future because of some disagreement. And what I found was, you know, in a practical sense, I was able to get more capacity at the same price just by using basically like a straw man, like another company posting so that they didn't feel like they needed to work with a company they, for whatever reason, weren't okay with. Yeah. Because they're going to charge me more to work with me. So I was able to pay, you know, Landstar a margin and he made money to do this with me, but I got a bigger benefit because we were able to hold the market at least consistent. And again, everybody did well. The carriers did well. They ended up working with us week after week and month after month. It was mutually beneficial to everybody. But when you're the only one trying to basically hire all the trucks to do the same thing every day, it becomes very difficult because they all have the leverage over you and they could just literally up their rate 50%. What are you going to do? Like you still got to move it. Yep. Like you're in a difficult, difficult place. Yeah. I think um, whenever you've got, uh, so you gave kind of a general way to use it, but it's a great example, right? Name recognition in a good way or a bad way could be a reason that people will use co-brokerage. So they might, like you said, someone might be like, I'm never hauling. You get like an owner operator that got 
burned once by, you know, yeah. somebody didn't pay a Tonu or, or no, whatever. They're yeah. like, I'm not like, they don't care. They're just going to blacklist that, yep. that broker, even if it was like one, one, one of 4,000 guys. Yeah, right. Um, but also like, if you think about, um, someone who, who has a really strong carrier network that is otherwise not publicly posting on load boards, right? Yes. You get access to capacity that you otherwise would never know existed, right? There's a lot yep. of really uh, big benefits to co brokerage and that, and you know, in that way as well. So I'll take you through B, which is that side of it, right? Like when I wasn't working directly with a shipper, I was the second broker supporting the. A broker or primary broker, right? So this brokerage was again attached to a motor carrier. So you have a separate brokerage and you had a motor carrier that worked with a lot of the big customers, right? And when I was prospecting them, like I intentionally called other brokers for like the first six months when I prospected at TQL because everybody else was doing everything else. Like it was hard to get leads for produce or any of the other commodities. Nobody wanted to call another brokerage because there was still a stigma that like, this is double brokering and you can't do this. So I spent the time to learn what we could do and not do. And I'm like, oh, this is a whole market nobody's going after. So I called brokerages every day and prospected them to try to find the ones that had more volume than they had capacity for, right? That meant they're leaving money on the table. That's their opportunity cost. And they didn't have enough staff yet to keep covering the loads and they couldn't hire quick enough. And they're basically just like, my customers want us to do more and we can't because we don't have a staff yet. My pitch to them was, let me co-broker with you. I'll help you grow. So I'll get you the trucks. You tell your customer, you'll take everything they can give you. And then as you make more money every month or quarter, now hire another person and then give me less freight. And then I'll shift it back to you. So I'm basically funding their growth by allowing them to you know, cover more loads for their customer, makes them look better, customers happy. We help them grow in a way that was mutually beneficial, right? Yeah. So- that's what it looked like. And that's exactly what we did. Like we, there were large customers and the brokerage that was my customer was like, look, these are the amount of loans and loads I can cover today. These are what I can't cover. And we would, they, we would call it like horse trading to negotiate rates so that we would split it down the middle and kind of like what we made. But basically at the end of the day, we just worked together, right? It was just two brokers that worked like we were literally at the same company, except when we posted to the market, they were from different brokerage MCs and yep. the money went through two different companies, but so, we very much worked like a team. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we'll talk about like, so broker B, right? When you're broker B, um, you have a lot more control because you're the one that's actually selecting yes. the truck. I want to give another example to kind of like what you just had, but a little bit different when broker B and I, I do a lot of this now is let's say a, I'll just generalize them and say a transportation company, right? It could be a brokerage, uh, someone that's, I mean, they have to be a licensed brokerage, but they're not, they don't all look the same, but any transportation company that maybe specializes in one type of freight, but their customers yes. have other kinds of freight, right? You, yes. like, let's say they they only do, um, they only do like flatbed, right? Standard mm -hmm. 48 foot flatbed, but you've got uh, expertise in heavy haul, and oversized stuff, and they are just turning away that freight from their customer. It's like, yep. no, 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 no. Like, you can be a single point of contact to continue to service that customer. I'll help you find the capacity where I'm an expert. It's a win, win, win for everybody. And when I go to hire that RGN, right, I know that I'm vetting their insurance, their safety record, all of this stuff. I have total control over that truck um, that's being hired in there, right? Versus when I'm broker A, depending on how the contract's written, I'm kind of at the mercy of broker B to hire the right truck, the right quality of truck, the right type of truck and all that. Cause that could damage your customer relationship. If broker B screws up when you're broker the risk. A. Yeah. And that is the risk, right? Because carrier, the broker B is the one talking to the trucks. So broker A really needs to trust broker B because that's the risk, right? Like if you're my B broker and I'm working with a shipper and you say you're sending in a certain truck and let's just say you made a mistake and sent in the wrong equipment, I'm the one that has to go and own up to that to my customer. Yep. I can't blame it on you. I have to go and say, we made this mistake that's on us. We'll make sure it doesn't happen again. And that isn't an easy place for lots of people to establish that amount of trust, right? <laughs> to be able for to do sure. those things. Other, um, other risks that we'll t I want to talk about here are um, 
if you miscommunicate or fail to set expectations on certain procedures. So whenever I do a co-broker and I'm broker A or broker B, I always want to talk through what does the invoicing process look like, right? Who Who's sending what, where, what are the timelines on it? What uh, unique identifier am I using to identify which load is mine or what's my load number and your load number? And then also how are claims handled, right? If there's a claim... Yes. Is broker B the one that's going to facilitate that on behalf of my shipper or am I going to have to step in and do that? And there's not like a right or wrong way. You just have the conversation. So when it something does happen, you're not like, uh, what do yes. we do now? You know what I mean? Yep. Um, Steven put a good one in here in the notes. Um, the risk of back solicitation. So yeah, this risk exists with just broker to carrier, but also broker to uh, broker to broker with a co-broker where you're you're essentially giving um, someone else access to your customer's freight whether that be you know a motor carrier and a standard transaction or another brokerage which is a bigger threat um, in the in the issue of a co-brokerage agreement so typically those agreements have a uh, no back solicitation clause in there and again if you are being transparent with your shipper about how you're getting capacity for them, right? You kind of set the expectation up front that this is my relationship. You know, I'm bringing this guy in to help me out. He's not here to, to take business away. Um, there's always going to be a risk because, you know, someone can just decide to go rogue one day and try to steal your customers. We see it happen with carriers uh, all the time where they try to back solicit. But the reality is if you've got good, strong relationships, that's going to weigh a lot heavier than someone trying to come in and poach. What do you think on that one, Ben? I definitely think that's true. I, I mean, there's always that risk that's out there that somebody's going to back, back solicit you a brokerage or the carrier, but there are things you can do to kind of protect yourself. Meaning like the BOLs I'm getting from my shipper are not what I'm sending to the other brokerage. The other brokerage is getting a rate con, which has the information I want them to see. So they're not yep. going to get my customer's point of contact info. They might not know who or how I invoice, how that setup process works. They might only and should really only have the pickup address, the delivery address, the relevant details to secure a truck and nothing beyond that. And to your point, if you do this well, your customer should be aware that they also exist. So if at any point they go to your customer, your customer is like, look, I, I know you guys have this relationship with Ben and his team. Why are you coming to us directly? And that is going to immediately make them look unethical and, yeah. you know, mostly dash their hopes of backdooring me anyway. For sure. For sure. So there you have it. Risks, pros and cons. Um, oh, I did want to add in here too. Uh, Steven added a note about the FMCSA fines. So this is a real thing. And we talked about this in DC the last couple of years that um, the TIA policy forum happened. There is currently a standing fine of $10,000 for illegal brokerage activity. All right. And the, I think it was 2023 when I was there, they had up to 80,000 complaints and that's just the ones that actually reported it, not the ones that went unreported or whatever. Um, if you, I remember the stat was like, if if they had fined ten thousand dollars on eight thousand carriers, it was an eight hundred million dollar revenue stream. And yeah, I just which did sounds like a lot of money, but the, the reality <laughs> is like these companies, like the, the illegal ones, you know, they're popping up and shutting down. You're not going to really be able to go get any money out of them. Um, but there is, you know, there's a there's a fine in place for the legit companies that cross the line. And until that is imposed on somebody, there's really no precedent being set that you can't get away with it. So it's kind of wild. I agree. It's like one of these things. It's like, well, if you have a regulation or a law that has a penalty and you don't enforce it, what's the point of having either the penalty or the regulation, right? Because if there is no repercussions, I mean... Human beings are human beings. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like if you if you tell your kid that you're gonna just gonna take something that. away from them if they act up, and then they act up and you don't do anything. What are they gonna do next? Taught them that they can do that and get away with right. it, regardless of what you say. So, yep, exactly. Well, good talk on Cobra. Let us know what you guys think in the comments. We've actually, <laughs> I appreciate all the comments out there. We've had um, some serious trolls on uh, on YouTube. Lately, um, some people love us. Some people hate us. Some people are indifferent. But um, for those of you that that hate us, 
we love that you're commenting because it's driving engagement and it gets us in front of more people um, either just like you or not like you, which we don't carry either way because it helps us get in front of more people. So thanks for the negative comments. Uh, what else we got, Ben? Uh, on like the bigger agenda or just related to? I don't know. Anything. I think that's kind of it for Cobra. And we're going to do next episode. I think we're going to talk about negotiating. Yeah, I want to talk. Yeah, too. And just get in the weeds on this. I'm doing more of it and well, prospecting more. So got more bids to work on and more lanes to work through. And it's just things I'm seeing over and over again. The one thing I want to do some content on that I was listening to a podcast this morning, they were it was a negotiation discussion, but it was negotiation to like buy companies. But the premise still holds for us, right? And they were like, you know, most people feel like they're on different ends of the table and they're opposing each other because they both want different things. And it's like, if you can just shift the perspective to like, both of you are really on the other, on the same side of the table. And what's on the other side of the table is just what the problem is you're trying to solve, right? And the other thing he had said in there is like, what would you need to do to be able to make this happen, right? Just asking that question. And it made me really think about what are the variables that are really important to a broker and a carrier, right? Like for a carrier, everybody defaults to rate. Why? Because rate and money is the only thing that mitigates every other risk. So it's the easiest one to go to. That's why everyone jumps and goes at it. But the reality is there are a lot of other things that are more important. It's just, if there's no trust, the other things don't matter, right? Like if you're a motor carrier, you might very well rather take 150 or $200 less on this load if you knew there was no dwell time, meaning like as soon as you pulled up, you could get loaded. Yeah. You'd probably also take it if you knew you could get loaded very quickly and be rolling with inside of an hour. That 200 bucks all of a sudden doesn't matter as much, right? And maybe that load's also lighter, which also saves you in gas, which is important to you. But the reality is, is like there's so much distrust between the carrier and the broker in these very specific and quick negotiations that like nobody believes anybody. So even if you have these things, it's really hard for a carrier to believe you because they've been lied to so many times that they all just revert right back to, well, I just need to get paid more for the risk because I just don't know if I can trust you on this load, right? And that leaves a lot of room to learn how to negotiate in a way that both people can win. So I want to build some of that content out on just like, what are the specific variables that are important to each? And why do we always end up only just talking about the money when some of these other things are equally or more important? Yeah. And how do you get the trust to actually make those other things that are important work in a negotiation, not just saying it to say it, right? So yeah, we can get into like the psychology behind the conversation and all that stuff. That'd be good. Yeah. Sweet. So- that's what I think. I, I mean, I'm kind of anxious to dig into and pick up next week, talk a little bit more about it. Also, as well as like the same thing for shippers, right? We can do the same thing for a broker and a carrier. It's the same thing for a shipper, right? And it's funny because like all week I'm talking to other agents that I work with or work with me. And I'm just like, everybody's customers are saying the same thing. And everybody's existing customers are saying a little bit different, but the same. Meaning like every new customer wants to pay either the bottom DAT rate or less than medium. If you look at anybody's customers they've had for more than a month, they're paying median plus about 10 or 12%, right? Closer to the high. And it just shows you like objectively, factually, that as your trust increases, the amount they're willing to pay you to work with their freight will go up. Yep. But in the beginning, they're never going to because there is no trust, right? And that's really just the whole business of freight brokerage, getting more shippers to trust you and more carriers to trust you so that you can use the other things that are important to both in a way that doesn't just cost more money, right? right. Because sure. they're there, it's just nobody wants to take the time to think about them. It's just go to rate and if the rate doesn't work, move on. And I think that's where a lot of opportunity is lost because people are only just looking at the one thing instead of all the other things you can use to have an advantage to make it work for everybody. Yep, So precisely. Good stuff, man. Great episode. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Ben, final thoughts. Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next time, go Bills. That wraps up this episode of Freight 360. Check out the show notes for links to anything that we've referenced on this episode. And make sure to visit us online at Freight360.net to see our entire library of episodes, videos, blogs, and more. And make sure to check us out on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily and weekly tips and content. If you'd like your question answered on the show, fill out the contact us form on our site and we'll see you next week.